Hi, today we're going to be talking about a programme called The Monastery and the Mansion. Um, and it was filmed up in a village called Nether Poppleton in uh, North Yorkshire, Series 12, Episode 2. And I'm joined today by Matt Williams. Matt, hi. Hi, how are you doing, Danny? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, how are you? Very well, thanks. Very well. Long time no see. Indeed, yes. It is years and years, isn't it? <laughs> and it's a long time since I thought about Nether Poppleton as well. But I've had a, I have refreshed myself and watched it. And I can't, and all the memories came flooding back. It was a great sight, really interesting. Oh, fantastic. Well, what was one of your favourite memories from that site then? Well, I do, it's not often that we dug in back gardens. We did quite a few back gardens in, over the years, I was a time team, but that was a really special site because we just covered the village in back gardens. And I, and I was in a certain area and we were jumping from one garden to the next. We banged out those test pits, those metre square test pits, pretty quickly really and uh, I do remember kind of running out onto the street and thinking right where do we go next where are we going to and we'd get the call and we'd you know tidy up and say goodbye to one uh, to, to one family or leave them uh, carrying on digging and we'd go to the next garden we'd start that one there get that one going and move around so I think frantic uh, or busy probably would be a very good way of describing that 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 uh, that, that uh, time deep. especially that first day day and a half and actually, you can see that in the programme where Carenza's running from test pit to test pit, saying, you've got to get your finds in, you've got to get your finds in. Because the, the interesting thing with that test pitting survey was that they were using that information to decide where they were going to put the bigger trenches. So, you know, it, it all had to be back in on that day, didn't it? It was a real logistical um, problem. Not really a problem, really. It was very, very complicated because we had all these mini excavations going on in the gardens. And then, as you say, we had to get all that pottery back in the right bags, uh, labelled properly to Paul and to Carenza. And then it had to be uh, kept in order where they, were, they had to know where everything had come from. There was a lot of bag labels, I remember, and a lot of writing on bags. And everyone would say, right, where's this from? Where's that from? People were running back across the uh, village. And, of course, the other thing, which isn't really mentioned in the programme, is that all these trenches were properly recorded as archaeological trenches individually by Wessex Archaeology, who did all the recording for those programmes. So it doesn't matter, it's just a metre square. They each had their own number. The stratigraphy was described, you know, here is the garden lawn, here is the stop soil, here is the subsoil. And in quite a lot of those trenches, there were layers going down to mark exactly where the pottery was from and all the finds were from. And it was a massive, massive job to get all those trenches photographed, recorded and drawn because... I can't remember how many there were. Over 30, I think, at the end of the day. Huge Actually, amount. there were th 32, 32 test pits Gosh, um, yeah. and, and a total of 16 trenches. <laughs> That's a, see, that is a huge amount of, of digging, really, isn't it? As like I said, the metre square ones, they weren't huge and, of course, you know, mostly dug by the families as well. Um, but still a lot of recording to be done and uh, a lot of backfilling at the end of it as well, I should think. And I think the fantastic thing with these test pits is that it's a really great example of community archaeology and how a community can actually discover more about their history and archaeology. And yeah. it, it's a really good example, I think, this particular time team. Yeah, it was, it was really lovely the way everyone came together. And, I'd, and that's one thing which I also had forgotten as well, the number of people that were involved, those uh, scenes at the beginning of the programme where the barn is just full of, you know, everybody, young, old, all really interested and uh, every single one of them was involved as well in digging. And I think that's really, really important because finding stuff and, and, and looking for pottery is actually the interesting bit, really. But in those gardens, people were looking for finds. You know, as Mick said at the beginning, the focus is trying to find pottery that will push this village, this with this village, further and further back. And it was great to see everyone involved. And... Um, I do recall as well, people, some of getting really, you know, really into it and quite excited about getting further and further down. And you do, you do have to kind of almost not exactly put the brakes on sometimes, but, you know, it feels as remember to keep your side straight, keep everything clear, make sure you bag your pottery up and mark exactly where it's come from. But it's fantastic. A really kind of exciting uh, air, I think, it was over the gardens. And there was a bit of competition as well. People saying, actually, my pottery is older than your pottery. This is kind of almost three programmes in one, isn't it? You've got the community archaeology side. Then you've got this um, search, really, for an early Saxon uh, monastery. And then you've got, you get the third discovery right at the end. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? So as I was watching the programme, I've got to say, my recollection of the trenches 
is not as strong maybe as the test pits because the test pits are fun. There are families everywhere. We were chatting and I can remember finding all this pottery and running back and forth. And, you know, the people recording the trenches were looking exhausted. And <laughs> but the trenches, I think you mentioned earlier, Danny, there were 16 trenches in addition to the 32 test pits. I'm not sure how many we saw on the programme three or four something like that I think it might well have been quite a few blank trenches or ones where we didn't really focus in very much or didn't really help us very much in the program I suspect I might have been in quite a lot of those trenches because they all have to be excavated properly they all have to be recorded properly and the fact that we didn't find much or we didn't find anything related to the monastery all has to be recorded and related back to the program as well so I think during that kind of day two and day three um, I was probably in quite a lot of blank trenches. In fact, I think there's a scene where I'm with Phil. Phil's got a great test pit. He's only a few metres away from me. He's found somebody's legs. You know, there's stuff going on. I've got tree roots. That might well have been the story of my day too. <laughs> Were you involved with the excavation of the Tudor mansion then? Yes. I think in, in day three, we all moved on to various bits of the mansion. Um, and so I can remember uh, cleaning up parts of the wall and those walls were huge, really thick. And I think from that, that's where we, you know, where we realised kind of how huge it, or how high it was, really. And it was a really thick foundation for these upper timber stories. I do recall cleaning those bricks. They were really solid, those Tudor foundations, really, really solid. And I think this is fascinating because it, it wasn't known about before, was it? No. And that's the joy of, of, uh, of time team, I think, really, isn't it? You start off looking for one thing um you kind of find something which isn't quite what you think it is and then that changes into something completely different uh, this is a perfect uh, perfect example of that and like there are other examples of times where we you know we found monasteries in scotland which no one was really quite clear about them and here we've got a, tu a tudor building it just goes to show what's out there really and how much you can find if you look in the right place with the right knowledge behind you and the right kind of analysis you know you can really find out quite clearly and easily you know, how, how your village grew up on, or, or what's on your doorstep, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even the local archaeologists hadn't realised it was there, had they? No. And I think sometimes, may, I don't uh, know how true this is in Nether Poppleton, but if you are looking at the same village all the time, maybe you, you need someone to come in from the outside and say, I've got an idea. It's nothing like what you think, but maybe how about this? I think uh, Stuart was great at doing that, Stuart Ainsworth. He would always come in, take a step back, literally quite all the time, and shift things around in his head and say, right, you know what, maybe what if that is actually that, and this moves over here, and the road never went that way, it went this way. Uh, and he was always really good at doing that, and I think that was, uh, and, and that was one of the things for this time team as well. If you take the ditch, if you take the big wall that we found, uh, the geophysics, you put it all together, it's like, well, it's got to be this. Uh, it's got to be this huge Tudor building. I think the fantastic thing is it's that sort of sharing of knowledge and information, isn't it? So you've got experts like Stuart uh, who come in and kind of, like you say, sort of readjust things. But you've actually got that local expertise as well. So you've got people that have been studying that particular area for years and know, know it inside out. And to be able to bring the two together, I think that was always the great thing with Time Team is that we always worked, you'd have professional archaeologists on time team working with other archaeologists locally. And I think that was a lovely combination. Yeah, and that was really, really important on all the time teams. After we always had, or wherever, wherever possible, we always had local archaeologists coming in. Um, a lot of the programmes were initiated, actually, by uh, local archaeologists who had an interesting theory or conundrum or something like that. And they were really, really helpful because they were uh, an amazing source of knowledge um, uh, 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 of how things have developed um, and research as well. It's like, well, we've got papers on this and we've got these, these maps here, which we've analysed. They were really handy because if ever we came to a site um, and just kind of, you know, put the time team team on it, we'd be missing, you know, half, half of the stuff straight away. And like I said, as, as like you said, it's a, it was great to have the two moving. It was great to have the two working together, really. The local knowledge was really the foundation for everything. But the fresh eyes sometimes really helped as well. So what was your favourite bit of this episode then? I, I think it's going to have to be the uh, test pits because, as I said, we did quite a lot of test pits in various time teams, but I think this was the pinnacle of all test pits. I don't think we ever really managed to do this many 
ever again. And the village was lovely. The villagers were lovely. Everyone involved was great. And we got some really, really, really great data from it as well. Uh, an amazing pottery sequence that really showed just in pottery how the development moved across the village, really. And, you know, eventually ended up in the uh, with, our, with our Tudor building. Yeah, but the test pits were, were fantastic. Always good fun to work in somebody's garden. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that one was really good. And so why should people watch this programme then? Well, I think what makes this programme stand out from others is, as I've just mentioned, the community side of it. This, I think this programme, more than any other, draws that community archaeology feeling out because the amount of manpower and local knowledge and effort that we got from the people of Nether Poppleton was huge. Um, and, th and that's the kind of unique point of this programme. And I think when you see that map at the beginning, um, and Tony says we've done test pits here and here, and before you know it, there's crosses appearing in every, everyone's garden. Every single one of those test pits was a family getting together, marking out their, their trench, getting on their hands and knees and digging. And they were all over the garden uh, and it was brilliant. And that's what makes that programme worthwhile, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I agree with you there. And I think it's quite interesting how it almost, it, it's a programme of kind of like, there's three parts to it really, isn't there? Um, the community archaeology. And then I think the, the uh, we haven't really touched on it much, but the monastic um, site that Mick was really keen to find. Um, mm. I think that's really interesting. Anglo-Saxon archaeology is so difficult to discover, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but to find that ditch, I think, was really interesting. And yeah. then the third kind of bit of it is the um, the Tudor mansion as well. So, yeah, there's kind of three different things all in one programme there. Brilliant. Well, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. Really nice to speak to you. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to catching up with you on an excavation soon. Thanks. Great to see you again, Danny. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, Matt. Thanks. Bye. I'm at the very start of a fugu and it might be that there's more of these tunnels and caverns existing on this site. We're going to be here in September, so please join us then and back us on Patreon so we can do more and more work on these wonderful sites. <laughs>